Hi, this is Marty Lackletter, Product Manager for HCL Leap with part two of the Salesforce integration video where we'll take a look at the technical details behind how the integration works. So just as a quick reminder of part one of the video, we saw how we were able to pass credentials over to Salesforce, have Salesforce return an authentication token, have Salesforce also return a list of accounts, contacts, information about products, installation options, as well as options on SLAs. So let's take a look at how all this works. Our Leap application makes a total of nine calls to Salesforce, the first being for authentication. It uses the OAuth method for authentication. And the way this works is you pass your credentials and some secret information over to Salesforce. Salesforce then returns an authentication token that token then must be included in all subsequent calls during your session. So let's take a look at how this works in HCL Leap. I'm in design mode with the application I just demoed. If I flip over to the settings tab, I can see all the service configurations that I have. So the first one is the Salesforce Access Token Service. So this service was chosen out of a catalog. So you can either put in a URL or you can select the service from the catalog. In this case we selected from the catalog and you can see here the Salesforce Access Token Service. Each service has inputs and outputs. So I should say potentially has inputs and outputs. You may push information one way and only get a status back. You may have no inputs and get output out. Um, but generally speaking they have inputs and outputs. So in this case for the access token service we have to pass a username and password, a client ID, and a client secret. And then we get back a number of different things. The only which one I'm really interested in is the access token. So these are all items which are returned from Salesforce. Here I've got a view into the server file system. If you can see the the folders, I've got opt, IBM, forms, service catalog one and then I've got all my service definitions including the one that I'm using for doing the authentication with Salesforce. If we take a look at this, these are simple XML declarations of how we interact with the service. You've got uh, a section up at the top which tells it which transport we're using. So this is the HTTP service transport which is included with the product you can build your own custom transports and use those as well. This suffices for working with just about any HTT based service, you know, or REST API, and then you declare the name and description. After this we have the inbound section. Now the inbound items are either parameters or they are constants. The, diff the difference being the parameters are items which are coming from your application. So these are assignable. They come from the application. And the constants are buried into the service definition. Things that typically don't change. You could also put some secure information here too since this is sitting on the file server. And then you have your mapping of how these inputs, whether they be constants or parameters, it really doesn't matter how they're coming in how they get communicated to the transport and then back out to the service. And then the outbound is just the opposite. I'm defining the parameters that are going to catch the outputs and then I'm mapping from the service transport to those parameters. So that's the service definition. And the beauty of doing your service definition in the catalog is that you can define it once and all can use. So let's flip over to the form and we'll take a look at how the service is wired into the application, how the service is invoked. So a couple of key pieces of information, the username and password. So these are not stored in the application. Uh, this is really just my browser trying to pre-populate things. And then I've also got uh, a user security token, a client ID, a client secret. And then over to the right you can see the authentication token, which this is the field that catches the output from the service. And then I have to take that token and then put the text bearer in front of it uh, because that's what the authorization header is set to. So there's a little bit of JavaScript that does that. Uh, the service is invoked with this button here and I'm actually invoking it through JavaScript. 
Uh, there's a few things I'm doing just before calling the service, which is why I threw it in JavaScript. And uh, calling services through JavaScript is, is quite easy, especially when you use the service picker or the picker, which you can pick any business object or UI objects, workflow stage if you want to, to, to use that or service. And you know, here's the token service, and there it is. Um, so that service is called. Uh, when I get the token and uh, the header, I then have an item change here that says go to the next page. And that page is the summary page, which the user then sees. So they, they go in, they put in their credentials, the button is hit, the call is, uh, is, is made. Uh, they see this little bit of text here, and this is hidden. Um, and then one other piece which is important is uh, before any items are saved, whenever the form is submitted for, for, for being saved, I have uh, some items here which just delete anything that has to do with credentials, secrets, login, tokens, etc. So those items never get saved uh, with the application. So once I'm authenticated and sent to page two, which is the main page where all the work is done, the on show event for that page fires off a number of other services to go get the list of accounts, the products, the installation options, the SLA options. And it tests to see whether or not it's the start stage. So this is the initial stage that Anne, the sales rep, would be in when she's doing the preparation of the quote. Uh, when it's in all the other stages, these don't happen. So for the rest of the service calls, I'm using the URL method to get information out of Salesforce. Um, we take a look at this one here, get list of accounts from Salesforce. And the way that this works is you put in a URL, and that URL uh, is looked at, and this particular query here, uh, everything after the Q equal sign is known as sales, Salesforce object query language. Uh, it's passed through this get call, and you can decide whether or not you want that assignable or not. So it is assignable. Um, and then for determining the outputs, uh, you fetch, you know, based on the sample you put in there. And you need to have an authorization header in here for this to work. And that's also assignable. So I'm picking up the uh, bearer token, which I pulled in via the first call. And from that point forward, it's. Um, the authorization token and then the query and then the outputs which it's determining via the fetch but in this particular case uh, I'm getting the account name and the ID uh, for the query on the input uh, and this is kinda nice because you can have the same base URL as just you're changing the query for each scenario that you're pulling information out of Salesforce in this particular case I built my application so that I have all the queries in one area on my application. So here's the query for get list of accounts and if you take a look at this it's uh, done in Salesforce qu uh, query object language. Uh, and select name account number ID from account where name like and then the percentage sign uh, is a wildcard in Salesforce. So that gets passed as a parameter for that, uh, that call. A couple of other things I would point out is this page is populated via services in the method just described with, with queries. When I select an account, uh, I get that value, the account ID value, and then I have a service here which is called get details of selected account. And if I take a look at this particular service, it's using the URL method, but the URL does not have a query. Rather, it's just uh, the account's object and then the, the account ID, and then it returns all the uh, the details for that particular account, which you can see here are the ones I'm interested in around um, the billing address, uh, street, etc. The other thing I do when the account is selected is I formulate the query for getting the contacts at that account. So you can see the query text here, uh, select ID, name, email from contact, which is the Salesforce object where account ID equals and then I'm pulling in this value, which is a variable I set through uh, getting the value via JavaScript. 
So I set that, that string to this variable query, and then I set the query for getting contacts on the page that I showed you earlier uh, to that string, and then I call the service using that. The final thing I'm going to show you is the clever use of workflow stages with services. So as you recall, I only want the, the initiator, in this case, and, and the sales rep to be able to authenticate and have all these services call. So the page for authentication, which is this first one here, this is shown in the start stage, but if I go to the services review stage, it's not shown. If I go to the customer ready stage, it's not shown, etc. So therefore, the only person or the only workflow stage that has access to that authentication and therefore the services is the person that's first filling us out, which in this scenario is the rep. So that's it. I hope you enjoyed this, found it informative. If you'd like access to the application, uh, please send me a note. My email address is there on the screen. Uh, I'm glad to send this to you. Of course, I'll send it to you without my credentials in the application. Uh, I'll also send you the XML file, the service definition, if you want that. Uh, and if you want more information, uh, you can go to hcltech.com, products and platforms, slash hcl leap. Thank you.